All right, so today I want to discuss the breeding age of ball pythons. How old does a ball python have to be before you can breed it? And it really depends on if it's a male or if it's a female. And pretty much the general rule of thumb in ball pythons is that the males have to be at least one year old and at least 500 grams. And the females have to be at least two years old and about 1,500 grams. And from my experience, I would probably wait a little bit longer, especially with the males. I actually bred a whole bunch of males last year that are about a year old. And let me tell you, those males, they're kind of on the edge. I had a really bad year last year, and a lot of those males didn't actually breed my females, which is kind of disappointing. And you know, you kind of get in a rush and you want to breed your brand new males after you kind of grow them up a little bit. And sometimes it turns out you, you can actually turn the whole season and into a bust which is kind of frustrating and for the females I say it's a little bit different with the females you actually can breed them at two years if they're 1500 grams but the problem is I'd say a lot of times if you breed them at 1500 grams sometimes they'll fast for a really long time and then after especially after they lay eggs they kind of build weight as they're kind of gaining weight from the eggs and as soon as they lay those eggs they kind of shrink down a lot of times to back below 1500 grams and a lot of times you're always fighting to get back up to 1500 grams if you breed them that second year versus if you waited a little bit longer you could actually keep feeding your females and they wouldn't go on the really long breeding fast and by the third year they'd have some really good size to where you could get even bigger clutches of eggs I think it's probably better than the long term to wait at least three years for your females and I actually had a male that was 400 grams believe it or not <laughs> I was kind of rushing this project I bought a scaleless head when the scaleless heads were first they, they're, they're kind of really dropping in price and I was really kind of aggressively trying to produce some, some scaleless heads. And the, the, the prices were coming down super fast. And I wanted to breed them and produce them before the, <laughs> the prices tanked. And of course, now the, you can get scaleless heads for almost nothing compared to what they were just a few years ago. And I actually took my 400 gram male scaleless head and I put it on top of my 5,000 gram female. It was like putting a little worm of a snake on top of this monster snake. And it was so funny. And believe it or not, they actually bred and I got a whole bunch of really good eggs and some hatchlings from that pairing but I'd say in most cases you really don't want to push it that much I've actually seen some people you know they'll produce like a world's first or a one-of-a-kind or they're trying to compete with someone else and they're trying to breed their snakes really super young but you know I always thought you know it's kind of worth the kind of worth the risk in some cases to actually try it and see if it'll work but let me tell you if you have a bad year like I did last year and I'm producing about 50% of what I normally would kind of produce is I I was, just, I was just using way too many, two small males. I should have waited one more year. So what I want to do is I want to show you some of the hatchlings that I actually have kind of growing up for this project. I actually have uh, my banana inchy clown. You may have seen that one. I bought it uh, just a few months old. And uh, last year I didn't breed it because I was kind of holding off on it. And this year it's actually two years old and looking pretty good. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to breed it in about two months. So I want to show you that snake, kind of the progress that the thing is. It's, it's getting pretty big and I want to take a weight on it and make sure it's at least 500. I'm thinking it may be about 800 grams or something like that. I'd say for the males, you, per, you know, preferably, I would at least wait for two years on your males. And I probably shoot for my, like maybe 800 or 1,000 grams on your male before you breed them. That was just my personal appearance. You, you, you definitely don't want to get down the road and kind of have a whole bust of the year because you're trying to use males that are too young. So let's jump over and then check out this banana enchi clown. All right, so take a look at this guy. This is my banana inchy clown. His name is Pasta. This is a really awesome snake. Probably the most expensive snake I ever bought. I bought him. Uh, I bought him last year as a yearling. He's about, I'd say he's about 400 grams when I bought him. And I actually tried to breed him last year. He's like right at 500 grams, right on the edge. And I actually bred him to two clown females. And neither one of those clowns actually laid eggs. It was a real big disappointment. Let me tell you, after you do that a few times and he kind of lose out on all those eggs from all those females you, you kind of regret breeding them that small you definitely don't do it I definitely will not breed a male after one year it's pretty much based on my results this year I, I'm getting uh, probably I'm about 50 hatch things less than I normally would get which is kind of crazy and this guy's just running and running take a look at the head on this guy and he looks like he's going into shed a little bit it looks like his eyes may be a little bit clouded over he's got some really interesting eye color almost like 
like a steel gray eye and it's really crazy it's kind of interesting how the the head shape is a little bit different than a normal ball python kind of almost like comical head shape which is kind of common with a lot of the clowns you kind of get the goofy head shape which is kind of cute I think and a lot of times with the clowns you get this really crazy head stamp on top of the head and then with the banana gene in this one usually with the banana as it ages and matures it gets freckles like freckling all through the snakes and it seems like when you mix banana with anchi that it really reduces the amount of freckling you get so this one actually has the anchi that really reduces the pattern the anchi was bringing in a lot of the kind of the orange on the side and kind of the interesting thing about this is the combination of the banana anchi really wipes out all the pattern of the clown you, as a matter of fact I was actually going over to morph market and I saw some banana anchis that almost look exactly like this and I started scratching my head thinking oh I, I hope this is actually a banana anti clown and pretty much you can tell it's a clown by the interesting shape of the head usually you don't see that with the banana anti usually just with the clown so see, I want to actually get a weight on this guy and see what he's coming in at you know I bred him at 500 grams last year and he didn't produce this year um, he's definitely over 500 grams he's been actually up against the wall he's been fasting for a little bit and I kind of recently switched over to mice to try to get him to eat a little bit better he's coming in at 800 and 64 grams that is probably I'd say that's an ideal weight for a male probably anywhere from 800 to a thousand and they say if you get males that are really super big sometimes they can get a little bit lazy and they won't breed the females which I've never really seen in my collection I was as a matter of fact I actually bred Bobby when he was pretty old and pretty big <laughs> he always he always bred really good which is not an issue but I've heard through the grapevine that you really don't want to breed them too big and you definitely don't want to breed them too small and take a look at the belly on this guy this guy is a really awesome snake pretty clear almost like a translucent almost like a really super shiny and slick belly he's a really super soft snake pretty awesome snake all right, so here is another two-year-old. Look at how big this guy is. This is one I produced myself. And it's funny, this guy has been eating pretty good and he didn't really go on a fast like the other one did. It's, it's, it's kind of frustrating when they're up against the fast and sometimes it kind of slows them down. And this one is actually, uh, this is a, a bamboo lesser, which is an allelic combination. This is a blue-eyed leucistic. This is actually one of Bobby's babies, the snake that I have around my neck. That is Bobby at the beginning and the end of the videos. And it's pretty amazing, you can actually hide bamboo in a blue-eyed leucistic and you can't even tell that it's in there pretty amazing and with this guy uh, I bred him last year to three females to three normals and none of them went I think this guy was just too small last year he's about 500 grams too let me tell you that's like five snakes five females that I lost out on trying to breed these young males and it was pretty painful he's definitely big enough now I'm thinking he's maybe maybe 11 1100 I'm, I'm gonna guess like one 1,150 grams. That's my guess. <laughs> That's one. Maybe 1,200. I don't know. Let's see if I can keep him in the tote here. He's coming in. Oh, he's even more than that. Wow. 1,466 grams. That is pretty awesome. And one of the things you definitely want to make sure that is, I'm, I'm actually going to check this right before I go back into the breeding season is you want to probe them or double check to make sure that they're actually males because that can actually be a bust for your season. If you think it's a male and you're pairing it with your females and you end up with nothing, you know, there's a possibility that you're actually pairing up a female, which would be kind of, you know, <laughs> kind of depressing, especially if you do it for a couple of years and then you lose out and then you find out later that you actually have, you know, a female instead of a male. But I definitely know that both of these are uh, are males which is I actually I actually saw this guy lock up with some of the females which is kind of interesting I actually put him with the females and he locked up and still I didn't get anything from this guy which is kind of maddening and kind of the weird thing about this is this is kind of cool he's kind of has this really faint yellow line right down the top of the snake and it seems like that's pretty common with a lot of your uh, bamboo lesser blue-eyed leucistics you can kind of see it up here and it seemed like when he was really young he had a, like a really strong yellow stripe right down the top and he's kind of aged and mature it's kind of faded out and if you actually look at his head his head's kind of interesting too he kind of has like slightly smaller eyes than a normal ball python and that can be pretty common with a lot of your blue-eyed leucistics in certain combinations and kind of the interesting thing I don't know if you can see his eyes they're like a super bright blue on the 
this one. Some of the brightest blue eyes that I've ever seen. Really awesome looking blue eyed leucistic. All right, so take a look at this one. This is kind of an unusual example. This is a one-year-old male. Look at how big it is for one-year-old. It is pretty amazing. This happens to be my triple het male, albino pied clown. So it's het for all three genes. And it looks pretty much like a normal ball python, but if you breed it to another triple het, I actually have three more females. And if you actually breed them together, you'll get albinos, you'll get pieds, you'll get clowns, and albino pieds, albino clowns. And what I'm really shooting for is the visual albino pied clown which would be really awesome especially if it's a male then what I'm gonna do with that one is I'm gonna breed it to more recessives and start doing the quadruple hats which would be pretty awesome as a matter of fact I wouldn't mind filling all my racks with you know quadruple hats and and like the the hepta hats I guess you go with the five hats and just have a whole rainbow of stuff coming out of normal looking snakes which would be really awesome and this guy even though he's that big let's we'll get a weight on him and see what he's coming in at He's been eating like a pig. He eats every single time that I put, you know, anything in there. He's coming in at 745 grams. And kind of the crazy thing is, is when I get done feeding and every time I have leftover rodents, I feed them to these triple heads. So they're kind of, you know, kind of, kind of all the leftovers, the rats and the mice, the frozen thought and everything that, you know, I don't want to throw them away. I want to use them. So these guys are pretty much the only ones that are kind of this size that can take that kind of rodent. So these guys are kind of like the garbage disposal. <laughs> down here in my reptile room they eat pretty much everything that's left over and they are getting really super big so even though this guy is that is is that big over 700 grams I probably wouldn't breed this guy the first year some I'd say most people probably would but based on what I've seen in my collection you know a lot of times it's not only the weight but it's the age and the maturity of the the hatchling it's hard to believe this is a hatchling this is this is a really big thing he's almost probably coming up against the thousand gram wall you know sometimes they get to the thousand gram and they kind of stop eating but that's a pretty awesome snake and kind of the interesting thing on the belly look at how chunky this guy is super chunky as a matter of fact he just he just ate a couple days ago so he's pretty chunky he had a couple decent sized rats and you kind of see kind of the het pied markers up along the belly and it's kind of interesting you really can't tell the het clown or the het albino it, it's, it's, it's a little bit jumbled up of a pattern maybe a little bit brighter of a snake. Some people say the head clown influence can kind of brighten up your snake, but that is a pretty awesome breeder. I definitely am not going to breed him this year. I'm going to wait one more year before I breed this guy. All right, speaking of triple head garbage disposals, look at how big this girl is. I didn't even know she was this big. I've just been throwing in rodents, all the leftover rodents, and she's just coming out really huge. Look at how big she is. That is pretty incredible. And this girl is just one year old. Hard to believe she's just one. I'm going to get a weight on this one, see what she's coming in. And it's, even if she's 1,500 grams, I definitely wouldn't breed her. After one year, that is kind of crazy. She's coming. Wow, she's over 1,000 grams. 1,016 grams at one year old. I've never seen any snake grow that fast as fast as this one. That is kind of crazy. So hopefully by next year she'll actually, she won't hit that thousand gram wall. I like to keep them a little bit chunkier. Not quite this big. I had no idea these were this big. And I like to keep them a little bit heavier when they're smaller because when they come up against that thousand gram wall sometimes they can stop eating for months and months and they get skinnier and skinnier and then whatever reason they just go back on food and then they, you know it's it's, it's pretty amazing with ball pythons. It seems like when they stop eating, they lose weight really super slow. They can go for a whole month and hardly lose any weight. And then, you know, a couple months later, they start eating on a regular basis and they just start, you know, gaining weight like crazy. This is this is pretty amazing. <laughs> this, this really surprised me. I've never seen a snake grow that fast. And that's what happens when you use some snakes as kind of a garbage disposal. I probably wouldn't recommend feeding them this much this fast. That's kind of... That's, it's kind of surprising that this girl is that big. All right, so take a look at this one. This is my lesser scaleless head male ball python. Believe it or not, this one's a year old too. And this, I'd say this is pretty much what you'd expect for a, a one-year-old that is eating really well. This is a really good example of what normally you have a really good eater as far as a ball python, a one-year-old. And sometimes you, you can't get them up to this size and it really depends on kind of the, the attitude of the snake. So in this particular snake, he was eating every single week, week after week. And then he got to the point where 
where he just absolutely refused to eat and he hasn't eaten uh, let's see uh, I just checked out his feeding card this month he had one rat and then last month he had one rat so I think the last time I tried to feed him I was trying mice and live mice and a whole bunch of stuff and it's funny they just kind of stop eating and then they just kind of stop growing and it's hard to believe he's only had one rat in the last month and look at how big and beefy he is and that's kind of the, the good part about kind of keeping him a little bit heavy and then they go into that kind of up against the thousand gram wall and then they stop eating and then just kind of you know they, they stop eating and then they still have a pretty good body condition even though they're fasting and I kind of want to get a weight on this guy to see what he's coming in at and he is probably over 500 he's coming in at 588 so when I was breeding those males they're about uh well, I'd say about 100 grams less than this right about 500 maybe a little under 500 so that feels like you know you look at a snake like this you know like that should be able to breed you know that's a pretty good size snake <laughs> and you actually breed them and then sometimes it can be a bust which is I don't know if it's if it's you know they I'm sure they have you know the proper size when you look at a snake like this I just don't think they have the the proper maturity to actually breed some females in all, all cases so in this one I actually wanted to breed this one to a couple lesser that I have and kind of the goal for this one is to produce the the completely white snake with blue eyes that is completely scaleless so this one's a scaleless head lesser if I read it to my other female lessers I'll get the blue-eyed leucistic scaleless heads and then I'll have to breed uh, the, I, I could probably breed this back to like a blue-eyed leucistic scaleless head you definitely need to breed two scaleless heads back together to actually get the completely scaleless so that is kind of the trick so I'd say I uh, you know, it'll take me probably at least three or four years before I get the all white scale of this thing. A little behind everybody else. Some people have actually produced them. I actually got into this project when everything was brand new and I was trying to, you know, shoot for the scaleless head, the all white, the, you know, all white blue eyed leucistic that was totally scaleless and none of them were ever produced. And of course, you know, the, 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 the more the years go on, the more people just keep producing them as the you kind of go. And, and a lot of times the prices will come down a lot too. So look at how big this guy is. Pretty Pretty big, pretty faded out from being in shed, but you'd think a snake this big could actually breathe something, you know? <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting, and let me tell you, I will never breed a one-year-old male again after my experience from this year. That's kind of one of my golden rules now. I'll definitely wait until my males are two years old. All right, so take a look at this crazy looking snake. This is actually one that I produced here in my collection, kind of a dinker project that I'm working on. I produced this one two years ago. This is a two year old female and take a look at that crazy pattern right on top of the snake. I have no idea what's going on with this female. Really crazy pattern and color. I actually bred my coral glow to one of my normal females that has kind of a, it's, it's kind of a weird pattern on that normal female. It's, it's almost like a, almost like a khaki camel flash color with a really open pattern the alien heads are all solid on that girl and she doesn't really have the traditional alien heads kind of an interesting looking normal and I popped out this crazy looking snake I can't quite figure out what it is there's quite a few snakes over on morph market that look similar and I haven't quite figured out when I want to breed to this girl <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll breed my coral glow back to it because this one's actually 50% head pod and if you actually look at the tracks on the belly look at that crazy belly on that snake really interesting I'm thinking she might be het pied which you know from the belly tracks it's it's kind of interesting because I've never really seen a really if you look at the belly this is kind of weird take a look at the scales on the belly they're really like small like really narrow belly scales which I've never really seen on another ball python really interesting appearance on the kind of the belly and uh, from the tracks on the belly I'd say she might be head pie and a lot of people have actually looked at this one and said they, they thought it was just an unusual looking head pied without any other genes in the mix but I'm not too sure on this one so I'm probably thinking about breeding this one maybe this year let me see what she's coming in as as far as the weight on this girl she's probably close she is 1,613 grams. So that's always the question, you know, do I breed them at this size or should I wait one more year and really increase the weight on this snake before I breed it for the first time? And I actually bred my clown female at about this size. And the problem is as soon as you breed them, they'll eat for like two or three months after you pair them up. And then they'll stop eating for months and months. And as a matter of fact, my last snake stopped eating for six months. The last snake that I just pulled the egg 
eggs from and she's still off of food you have to get her back on food after <laughs> to lay eggs so you know that can really be hard and kind of slow down the growth of your snake so if I actually waited one more year on this girl and just kept feeding her for a whole year before I paired her up I would get a lot bigger clutch size from the following years you know pretty much year after year and she is a really interesting snake I've never really seen anything quite like her just kind of randomly popped her out which is always interesting with the dinker projects I was thinking if I bred her back to my coral glow maybe there's something that's maybe this is like hidden in my coral glow where I don't really know what it is and then maybe I can hit the super which would be probably pretty awesome or the, the other possibility is maybe I have one gene in my coral glow and one gene in that normal that this is actually the super so it'd be kind of interesting to see what comes out of it. of course if you breed it to the coral glow half the offspring will come out chloral glow and if this one's had pied then you'll also get some pines and it's kind of hard to prove out dinkers unless you actually breed them to a normal so probably what I'll do I might actually try to breed this girl this year and see if I can produce uh, kind of reproduce kind of this weird pattern maybe produce some visual pines and some coral glows and some interesting stuff and then maybe the following year maybe I'll breed her back to like a normal or something and see if I can actually produce this interesting pattern all right, so here's the last one I want to show you. Take a look at this. This is actually a pastel pinstripe scaleless head female that has been running and running. She's like trying to get away from me and go all over the place. I'm trying to calm her down, crazy snakes. Sometimes I get on camera and they get out here in the bright lights and they just want to take off. They do not like the bright lights. They're like, hey, put me back in my dark enclosure. And the cool thing about this is it almost looks like it has a little bit of enchi in the mix. If you actually look at the pattern, it's almost reduced into these little blobs which is usually characteristic of the Enchi gene, although I didn't have Enchi in either one of the parents, so I don't know if it's a kind of a combination of the scaleless head gene or if it's just, you know, kind of an Enchi kind of hidden in your collection. Sometimes you can have, you know, a little bit of kind of hidden genes here and there, and then you randomly pop, <laughs> especially heads and stuff like that, and she's getting pretty big. She's getting really close. I'd say she's close to 1,500 grams. She's probably not at the, at the weight. She's two years old, so she's pretty close. Let's see if we can actually get a weight on her. She's coming in at 1,363 grams. So she is definitely not up to size. Some people might try to breed them this young, but probably what I'm going to do on this one, and I actually have another one exactly like her, pretty much the same weight from the same clutch. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to wait until that lesser scaleless head gets up to weight, and then I'm going to breed this one with that lesser scaleless head, and then I can get some completely scaleless pastel pinstripe lessers which would be pretty awesome and kind of the interesting thing about the scaleless project is that when you do produce the completely scaleless ball pythons you get pretty much uh, a completely unexpected result as far as the visual appearance and you almost have to relearn all your genes again trying to figure out what genes you have in your scaleless ball python I actually did a video on the scaleless and let me tell you even just like a lesser scaleless does not look like a lesser ball python it's kind of weird uh, everything changes once you kind of you know remove all the scales by breeding into the completely scaleless all right, so there you have it. I'd say there's a minimum age and a minimum weight component when it comes to breeding ball pythons. And as a matter of fact, I think you could do pretty good if you actually took your ball pythons and bred them every other year instead of every year, breeding them one year and then giving them the second year off. You may produce maybe fewer eggs up front. You know, it seems like when you get into ball pythons, you're like, I want to buy some hatchlings. I want to raise them up. And then it's always like, you know, I've been waiting years for these hatchlings to finally mature. But once you finally get there and you have some decent sized snakes, I think you could do pretty well probably breeding them every other year one year on and one year off and give them that year off to really beef up their size get them a little bit bigger every other year to really boost your production long term i think that would be a really good plan so that is pretty much it thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video